So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I love singing with you. I love it when there's the sense that the words that we're singing are really resonating within us. And I think that that does, of course, sometimes our voices just aren't able to carry what's inside of us. But when our, all our voices are, are, are good and strong, uh, it, it, it does, it is evidenced uh, by the volume and the, um, I think, the, uh, just the, the, the spirit. You know, there's a scripture that says, sing in the spirit, pray in the spirit, 1 Corinthians 14. And I think that singing in the spirit has to do with a spirited singing. Uh, and it is because we are connecting with the things that we are singing. We're not just, it's not just a melody to us. Well, I've, I've uh, emphasized over the last couple of months on the Sunday night that I've preached uh, matters relating to our union with Christ. And that's been a subject that has been emphasized it is a subject that I don't want to stop emphasizing, though I'll not obviously be preaching on it on, uh, you know, every every month. But it wouldn't be a bad thing to make reference to on a regular basis, a monthly basis, uh, even a weekly basis, because it is the foundation to our relationship to God. It's the foundation to our life, our union uh, with Christ. Um, and and yet, speaking about union with Christ, sometimes it's hard to conceptualize. We talk about it. And yet to actually get an, I guess you would say a picture in our mind, just, you know, a concept of what that, what that actually looks like is difficult because there really isn't necessarily a look to it. It's a spiritual thing, it's a re, but it's a reality. Uh, it's kind of like saying, as we'll see in our text, it's kind of like saying, um, you know, when you're married, you become one one flesh you become one i mean there's a there's a oneness that exists there that's not just physical there's a oneness that exists exists there that's hard to sometimes it's hard to actually describe it but you know it because you're experiencing it right i mean you experience that with your spouse like you do with no other uh, there's something unique about that and i'm sort of racing ahead of the thoughts here to say this at the outset but that's what's in our text uh, and it's a significant part of what we'll be looking at this evening. But our union uh, with Christ uh, means that Christ is in us. It's not just that uh, we are in Him, and, and that's sort of hard to, you know, we are seated with Him in heavenly places. You know, that's hard. to We talk about that. That's language we use. But to conceptualize that, uh, we, we embrace that by faith, but Christ is in us, and there's a sense in which that's more of the experiential side, is Christ in us, and um, we are His completely. And that's what Paul is really driving at here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to read verses 15. Uh, well, maybe we ought, to, we ought to begin in verse 12, because that really does begin the thought but we're going to focus uh, from verses 15 through 20 tonight. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Some think that Paul is the first part of those statements are statements that uh, Corinthians were making. It was a philosophical statement that they were making. I'm not sure that that's necessarily true, but he's correcting it, or at least he's balancing it by saying, while it may be true that all things are lawful, all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for, for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. This is an, an, an example. But God will destroy both it and them. So, so they can't be the controlling factors in your life. Uh, now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And it may seem strange that Paul quickly goes to that thought, but it, it is in the context of the Corinthian church and what they were dealing with. It was a big deal. And uh, he goes on, And God both raised up the Lord and will raise also raise us up by His power. Speaking of the body. Uh, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? 
Certainly not. God forbid. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her. He repeats this idea of, uh, do you not know, several times in this chapter, more than any other place in Scripture, four times I think it is, it's as if he is saying, you should know these things already. It's essentially what he's saying. I'm having to tell you things that I've already spoken to you about. You should know these things. Do you not know? That he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. So this is one of two imperatives. Y'all know what an imperative is, right? A command. Okay, it's like a thou shalt or thou shalt not. Okay, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And the, the New King James and modern translations say sexual immorality. The Old King James says fornication. I, I, I like the word I like the word fornication. I, I, like, the, I like the use of that word fornication. Uh, but it, it is a broad word, and so sexual immorality is a good translation because it is, it is speaking of the broadness of sexual activity, immoral activity. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, and here's the second imperative, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So there's two imperatives in this passage. Flee fornication and glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are, which are God's. So Paul specifically emphasizes in verses 15 through 20 the significance of how we use our bodies. The Corinthian culture was very sexually oriented including worship in pagan temples, which was sexually oriented. They also were influenced by a philosophy that taught that what you did with your body was amoral. In other words, your, your, your body was, you could do with your body what you wished. It's your spirit really that counts. It's be kind of like the three Hebrew children saying, well, we'll bow down to your God, but inside we're really not bowing down. No, no, they, they, they didn't say that because they knew that their body was connected with their spirit, their soul. You don't disconnect the two. And of course, this is much like what we see in our present culture. This philosophy is really a part of our culture. That it, the whole idea of my body, my choice kind of philosophy It's, and I know there's more to that saying than, than this, but it, it's like, it, it's, not, it's none of your business how I use my body. It's no bit body's business how I use my body. It's my business. It's my body. I can do with it what I please. And Paul is arguing that's just simply not true. Now, there is liberty in the way that we satisfy some of our natural body desires, right? I mean... When you satisfy your stomach, verse 13, I mean, you, you can satisfy your stomach with herbs or you can satisfy your stomach with, with meats. You can, be, you can be vegetarian. You can be all the other tarians. You can be whatever you want. You can choose. And, you know, it's really up to you, right? You, you, there's choices. And it may or may not be right for you to eat meats, even meats sacrificed to idols. Paul deals with this. And we've dealt with that in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8. Depending on the circumstances, it may or may not be right. So there's liberty there. But sexual desires are unique. You do not have liberty to satisfy sexual desires as you please. And so what, would you, what you would say about your liberties was some things you cannot say about this thing, fornication. It's always wrong. No exceptions. That's what Paul is arguing here. 
And he gives fundamental reasons in these verses to support the central command, flee fornication and glorify God in your bodies. And he gives reasons for it through from verses 15 through 20. We want to work through these thoughts tonight. Sexual sin is serious. It's serious enough to require this kind of response. Flee. Flee. There's, I think, I may be wrong here, but there is one other thing that we're told to flee in Scripture. You know what it is? Idol fleshly lust. Idolatry. Fleshly lust would be uh, go, you know, fit with our context here. But idolatry. It's in First Corinthians chapter ten. Flee idolatry. And you know what idolatry is? Spiritual fornication. It's interesting. Flee fornication. Flee a sexual immorality. Flee idolatry. They're closely linked. One is physical, we think. One is only physical, sexual immorality. But there is a spiritual component to sexual immorality. We're not going to dig deeply into those thoughts tonight. But I think we can see it even in this text. And so we first notice what Paul says about the relationship of our bodies to Christ. Now, now, as he uses the word body here, he's not talking about the church. He's talking about you and me individually as members of the church. He's talking about individual believers and our bodies, our physical bodies. When he says in verse 15, your bodies are members of Christ. Do you not know that? This is union language. We are one with Christ. Our union with Christ is not just spiritual. It is that. Verse 17, but, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. But, but that is the basis really of saying that our bodies are Members of Christ, we are in union with Christ means not only our spirit, but also our bodies. And because our spirit is in union with Christ, our bodies are in union with him. This fundamental truth should affect our sense of the significance of our treatment of these bodies and the use of our bodies, every aspect of our bodies. It raises the level of importance, doesn't it? In other words, your body is not a throwaway container for your soul. By the way, this is one reason why I object to cremation. There is going to be a bodily resurrection. And when we bury a body, we are demonstrating respect we are recognizing God made this body, and that body is going to be raised again. And this is I'll say more about that in a Sunday school lesson in Genesis when it's my turn to teach on one of the chapters. Uh, talks about a funeral. But, but you understand the point. These bodies are important. They are not just... People say, oh, my body doesn't matter. All that matters is my spirit. That's not true. That's a lie. Okay? Don't, don't buy into that. It comes from a certain philosophy, and it's an ancient philosophy. By the way, that's one of the reasons. Well, let me not go there. I, was, I can launch off onto so many thoughts here. But just understand this. Your body is not a throwaway container for your soul. No, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Christ in you. The Spirit of Christ in you. Isn't that a phenomenal thought? A temple. A temple is considered a sacred place. Old Testament Israel had a sacred place that God uniquely resided. Where God uniquely resided. And it was made sacred by His presence there. Corinth had a sacred place too for the worship of Aphrodite. I don't even recommend that you look up 
Aphroditus to save you. In fact, I would say flee fornication. Because Aphroditus is synonymous with fornication. It was part of the Corinthian culture. They had temples and horrible things went on there. When Paul says in chapter 6 and verse 9, when he says, uh, talks about homosexuals and sodomites, he is referring to that which existed in the Corinthian culture in the temples. These were priests and priestesses who were harlots. And I'm trying to be careful. And I've asked the Lord to help me to be careful in the way I express myself tonight because I don't want to cause you to stumble even in the way that I express myself tonight. But brethren, you know what your body is? Your body is a temple. It is a place that is made sacred by the one who dwells in you. The Spirit of Christ dwells in you. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Isn't that sort of a strange concept in a way? Because you ask questions, well, how can that be? How, how can He dwell in me and I not explode? How can He dwell in me and I have my own choices? How, how come I'm not a robot if He dwells? You know, we have all these thoughts about... But the fact of the matter is the Holy Spirit dwells in you and it's up to you to not quench or grieve that Holy Spirit who dwells in you. You have a responsibility in relationship to the Spirit who dwells in you. But the fact of the matter is you are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Whom you have from God. He has given Himself to you. Your Body, your body, it matters to the one who dwells in you how you use your body. You're, you're not your own, verse 19, the end of verse 19. Whom you have from God and you are not your own. Verse 20, for you were bought at a price. Our bodies are no longer ours to do with as we please. There's a sense in which we could argue our bodies have never been ours. We didn't make them. We didn't create them. We, we were born, really, subject to the one who created us, ex except we were born in sin and shapen in iniquity, and so we served another master from birth. We have a new master now. A, a great price has been paid for the possession of your body by God. Of course, sin and death that claimed you has been conquered by Jesus Christ. And you have been ransomed from your enslaved condition by the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. We're not going to go into all the details about the price that was paid. I'm, I know that you're familiar with the price that was paid, but I'm telling you, that you, you know, at one point tonight when we were singing the song, uh, was it, there is a fountain filled with blood uh, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I mean, I just got... Chills again saying that. Drawn from Emmanuel. It hit me sitting there. I almost wanted to stop and, and just not sing anymore. It just hit me. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins? God? In the flesh? Do you understand the price that was paid for you? We purchased a high price. And being joined by faith to the Lord, verse 17, in these bodies we are one spirit with Him. In these bodies we are one spirit with Him. And so Paul drops that thought in verse 17. It is not just your body. It is your spirit. It is body and spirit, which in verse 20, he concludes, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. And I understand that some of the modern translations don't have and in your spirit. But it's in the Bible and in your spirit. I believe it should be there. It fits the context. It is not just your body. It is not just your spirit. So Paul is describing these truths to us as motivation to the proper use of our bodies, especially in relation to the strong impulse of sexual gratification. Now think about the incompatibility of fornication with the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
You want to think about that for a few minutes? I mean, you can't read these verses and not think about that. The incompatibility of fornication, sexual immorality with your body. Your body, the temple of the Holy Ghost. In verse 15, the way Paul says this, and remember Paul wasn't, we don't think that he was married. If he was married, he, he, he at some point was no longer married. Some argue that he was married at one point, but I, I don't see, because he was a Pharisee, and they say that Pharisees, one of the rules for Pharisees is that they were married. And, and so I, all I know is I see no um, reference that Paul makes to himself being married in Scripture. So I, I just, he's at least single when he is engaged in his apostolic ministry. But listen what he says. Shall I then take the members of Christ? And so he's not just talking about married people here. He is talking about any child of God who, whose body is a member of Christ. Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? And this, the answer is so strong. It's the idea Paul was, it, to Paul, it was totally unimaginable to unite his body with a harlot. Now, what is a harlot? Well, it may refer to one who sells herself sexually. For financial gain, we might say her or himself in the context of the Corinthians. And probably in the context of our own day. So it may mean that or one who engages in any sexual activity outside of marriage to satisfy lust. In other words, someone who is doing that, regardless of whether it's for hire or for money, that person is categorized as a harlot. And it could be a man or a woman. And Paul is saying, how can we do that? How can we even think about doing something like that? Taking that which belongs to Christ and use it as if it belongs to our base lust. That God made our bodies for us to just satisfy our base lusts. We don't have permission to use these bodies in that fashion. You are not your own. Shall I then take the members of Christ? Boy, that, that makes it very personal, doesn't it? You see, you're not just taking your body. You're taking the members of Christ. That's Think about that the next time you're tempted. Taking... The members of Christ. This is a this this links our activity with Christ. It's an affront to him. And this thought alone should be enough to mortify any sinful sexual desires the next time. A sinful sexual desire arises in your mind and you're moved in the direction of fulfilling that. Don't forget, you are taking Christ with you into that activity. Think about that. That ought to be enough to kind of say, whoa, whoa here. And then in verse 16. Sex outside of marriage contradicts God's design in creation, which is, which is marriage union. And you know, one of the reasons that I'm speaking to this tonight is because of the generation in which we, our, our children and young people are growing up in and the impact of this generation upon those of us who didn't grow up in it. But it's almost like we get jaded and we get... We sort of get, it's kind of like the frog in the pan, you know? The, the, the water just kind of heats up and all of a sudden the frog's, the frog's cooked. It didn't really, it's kind of like, well, maybe it's not so bad. You know, maybe we're making more of this than we ought to make of it. No, we're not. 
This is God speaking to us. Sexual, let's read the verse. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? It is not just, a, it is a sexual pleasure thing, but it's not just that. You are joining yourself to another body. Graphic. To her or him. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. That's how it was from the beginning. That's how God intended. Sexual immorality is an act of rebellion, really, against God who designed one man for one woman. One woman for one man. To join yourself to another who is not your spouse is an act against God's design. These are elementary things, aren't they? Of course. Do you not know? Right? But we should know these things. And why do we have a problem in our churches? We're not thinking properly. We're not focused as we should be. We're not remembering who we really are in Christ, in union with Christ. We're not. We couldn't be. We couldn't be and engaging in sexual immorality. You know, marriage involves a total commitment of two individuals to one another like no other. Right? And, and we could turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31 where it's stated again there that the two shall become one flesh. And that is specifically talking about the marriage union. And, and by the way, and this is not the main thought tonight, but one of the egregious things about sexual immorality, that is sexual activity apart from the spouse that God has given to you, is that you are striking at the very picture of the gospel. That's what makes it so egregious. It's not just that it's a breaking of the seventh commandment or the commandment of God. It's that it is tainting the very picture of the gospel, that union that you have with Christ that is pictured in the union you have with that one woman, that one man. See, this relationship of unique unity is expressed in the sexual union. Sexual union was not intended to be a selfish act. And too much of the time it is. And, and perhaps more for men than women. And, I, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to draw a line here so how far I go with what I say, but we're living in a very graphic age, aren't we? This isn't a puritanical age where you, know, you had to kind of uh, dance around the issues. I tell you, the world doesn't dance around the issues. There is a, a, a sexual desire that man and woman has and and other desires related to that that are fulfilled but to do so selfishly to only think of yourself is not what god intended in that sexual relationship that's the very thing that motivates people to go outside of the marriage union it is idolatry self worship that's going on Which is one of the reasons why it is a unique sin to be, to be avoided at all cost. Fornication is the union of bodies. Fornication is the union of bodies, not the one flesh union of marriage. 
in verse 16. You notice he says, or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. He doesn't say shall become one body. He says shall become one flesh. Some have argued that it's one and the same. I, I, I'm not convinced that he's saying one and the same. You might become one body with many, right? You can become one body with a multitude of individuals. But you don't become one flesh with a multitude of individuals. You become one flesh with one other person. To become one body with any other than the one with whom you are one flesh is rebellion against God's creative design and order. Think about that. Sexual union is God glorifying. We should not speak of sexual activity within marriage as if it's some sort of... And I think there's those who, because of experiences in life, because of upbringing, because of whatever, there are lots of things, but they think of it as some sort of nasty, dirty thing. It is not. It is a, it is a beautiful thing in the context in which God intended it. And we need to view it that way. It's actually glorifying to God. I'm just going to go ahead and say this. I just I'm trying to be careful, but someone recently said to me that a husband and wife that, and it may have been someone in here, I don't even remember who said it to me, so if you said it, I, I don't remember, I'm not saying it because I remember you said it, okay? They said it to me that, that their, their physical relationship was, was, they were talking about their relationship in the marriage and demonstrated in the fact that in their physical relationship, it wasn't just a physical relationship and that's all there was. They actually engaged in prayer afterwards thanking God. It was a, a matter of glorifying God even in that expression of unity. Does that seem bizarre to you? And so I think that, that we do need to be thinking that in, in, our, in our marriage relationships. We're glorifying God and, and be thankful that you have that relationship with a spouse that God has given to you and don't look for it anywhere else. Verse 18. Sexual immorality is a unique sin in the way that it affects our bodies. Verse 18 is not a simple verse. He says, flee sexual immorality. That's kind of like the heart of 15 through 20. It's right in the middle. It's like, this is the command, flee sexual immorality and glorify God in your body. Those are the commands. And, and all, everything else is sort, of, uh, is sort of supporting those imperatives. He says, every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Some have suggested that when Paul says every sin that a man does is outside the body, it's kind of like what I suggested back in verse 12, that this was a Corinthian slogan that Paul is correcting. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. Of course, we know that every sin that a man does is not outside the body, right? We, we know that uh, that's, there are sins that are, that are heart-level sins, right? And so every sin that a man does is outside the body. But there, there was this idea, as I suggested earlier, in the Corinthian church... They may have been justifying sexual immorality. As I heard recently, a preacher actually was justifying his pornography 
that he said he wasn't addicted to. He just helped out his relationship, his marriage relationship, by his pornography. And after all, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He wasn't hurting anybody. I mean, what he did with his body, it was just that was just the body. In my, in my spirit, I'm still worshiping God. That, that's a lie. That's just a bold-faced lie. Don't believe that. Not true. And that's a preacher. So-called. But there was this reasoning, apparently, among the New Testament churches, the Corinthian church, where there was this justifying of sexual immorality, what Paul is calling sexual immorality, reasoning that sin is not really about the use of the body, but the spirit. And so Paul is clearly making the point that sexual immorality is especially against one's own body. It's kind of like he's, in, 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 rather than saying, well, I'm not sure I agree with you, he's saying, no, absolutely not. In fact, it's especially against your body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. We might even say, and I'm not sure that this is right, but we might say, since you are one flesh with your wife or husband, but if you commit sexual immorality, you are sinning against your body, meaning your spouse who is one with you. But I think Paul has in mind more, you are affecting your body and you certainly are affecting your relationship, your marriage relationship, in ways that are unique to this sin. There are other sins of the body, as opposed to sins of the heart, that involve a lack of self-control. There's drunkenness and there's gluttony, for example. But there is no sin that is as uniquely damaging and destructive as this sin of sexual immorality. It's in a unique category. When Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 1 and verse 24, he referred to it as a dishonoring of their bodies. Dishonoring their bodies. This sin, and young people, listen to this. And, and, and I mean, everything, everything in the world you're growing up in throws at you that this is a, this is, I mean, this is what, you live for this. Live for sexual pleasure. Our culture is inundated with it. This sin, you need to hear the truth. It's kind of like hearing the other side of drinking, right? You know, I believe I have the liberty to drink. Okay, fine. But you need to hear of the horrible consequences of drunkenness. In this case, there is no little bit of fornication's okay. Fornication in moderation is okay. Get it? There, there, there is nothing like that. It's wrong. Totally. And there's a reason for it. It is uniquely damaging. And it doesn't stop with one act. It doesn't stop with one fall. Unless you mortify, unless you deal with it properly. This sin goes against the very foundational fiber of life and God's purpose for our bodies. That's why it's presented as a unique sin. It's a sin that has resulted in much pain, destruction, and even children who suffer as unwanted consequences. And by the way, children who suffer from the diseases that come from sexual immorality. A.T. Robertson said this, and he said this years ago, and I, I'm not quoting everything he said because there's been some advancements since he wrote what he wrote. There was a time where, uh, you know, things like gonorrhea and uh, syphilis and uh, you know, that those, there, was a, there was a time when those STDs were incurable. Well, apparently now they are curable. At least the physical is curable. When A.T. Robertson wrote, they weren't. And so he, I'm not quoting that part, but he's referring to that when he says this. 
Apart from the high view given here by Paul of the relation of the body to the Lord, no possible father or mother has the right to lay the hand of such terrible diseases and disaster on their children and children's children. Because those STDs can be passed down. A child born can contract it. Paul is talking about that in veiled language here, but it's a sin against his own body. Your body is affected by it. And so A.T. Robertson says the moral and physical rottenness wrought by immorality defy one's imagination. I don't think that we, I don't think that the language that I'm using as I'm seeking to portray what Paul is giving to us tonight, I don't think any language is, is too harsh to use in reference to sexual immorality. So what are the exhortations in light of these arguments that Paul is giving? Flee. Sexual immorality. Flee it. Listen to this strong command. It is not an overstatement. Flee. 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 Don't flirt with sexual immorality. Flee it. And by the way, the Greek word for sexual immorality is porneia, porn, ea, pornography. And it's everywhere. Whether it be soft or whether it be, I don't even know what's out there. I don't care to know. I don't know what they do. I don't want to know. I don't want to talk about what they do in secret. But you need to avoid it. Do not tempt yourself. Let me ask you, what means have been a temptation for you? And some of you young people are growing up and, and, you're, growing, you, you, and you're experiencing your, your things in your mind, in your body, and, and there's these desires. And desires that you think, I mean, some, at the older you get, you're, you're wondering what to do with these desires. And those desires are not sinful, by the way. God made you to have those desires and to, and to fulfill those desires in a marriage relationship to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband, right? But there are temptations and what are they for you? Somebody said, other vices are conquered by fighting, lust by flying. Don't allow a thought to develop. And there's not a soul in here that can tell me you haven't had thoughts. And some of you, I know some, maybe some of the ladies are saying, I, I can't relate or whatever. But you can, you know, there's, 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 Fornication, uh, sexual immorality reveals itself in more than one way. But I'm telling you, if there's any thought in your mind of unfaithfulness to your spouse in any way, don't develop the thought. Shut the door on it. And that's not always easy, is it? But if you have the Spirit of Christ in you, you have the capacity to do that. Don't scroll through the internet on your phone. And if something inadvertently pops up, what do you do with it? 
What should you do? Flee! Right? If you have to, throw the phone in the lake. Do what you got to do. I'm telling you, sexual desires have a way of distorting our senses. Even justifying a sinful act. Well, it's only once and I won't do it again after this. And you know, she hasn't really been too warm and cuddly lately. So you know what, I, I just, I, you know, maybe I'll help her out, you know, by just satisfying myself. Those are the thoughts that go through the mind. When sexual desires are strong, and, and they can come out of nowhere, can't they? They're like, where did that come from? Where did that thought come from? Fiery darts. Now, what do you do with it? Flee. Flee. At whatever stage of temptation you find yourself, run for all your worth. Remember Joseph. And, the, and this is just a great illustration. I know you're familiar with it. I assume you are, but just listen to this. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. And Joseph was not a married man, but he was a man. And you have a woman and a woman in power and a woman with some prestige and a woman that really shouldn't have any interest in you. You're a servant. But she's showing interest. Be hard to say no. Give them the right circumstances and don't do this old pious thing like, oh, it wouldn't affect me. No, it would affect you if the circumstances were right. There's not a soul in this room that couldn't fall to sexual immorality if the circumstances were right. That he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife. Way to go, Joseph. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It wasn't just an issue of his master. It was an issue of God. He was joined in his spirit to the Lord. He was, if we say in New Testament terms, his body was a member of Christ. So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside. If I could give Joseph some counsel, I would have said, you shouldn't have gone into the house. But I, I, seriously, I would say that. Don't go into the house. Don't go there. But given the circumstances, I, you know, I'm reading into it from my vantage point. But she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. He fled. But he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and ran outside. He fled fornication. He fled sexual immorality. Make a covenant with your eyes like Job, not to gaze upon a woman. You say, well, I mean, we're li you, you, cannot, you cannot not look. I mean, you can't, you can, you can't walk around blind. And, and, and there are women who are revealing themselves in such a way that it is tempting and enticing to look, right? And, and ladies, believers, you need to think about that. Your body is not yours to put on display. God didn't create your body for that. It, it's, it's for the one that God gave you. In the sexual way, it's for her, it's for him, not for everyone else. 
But, but men, I'm telling you, it's your and my obligation to look away, not to stare, not to gaze. Because the more you look, you know what happens. The thoughts begin to, to go, to develop. And then glorify God in your body and in your spirit. That's the other exhortation in light of everything that's been said tonight. This should be the guiding principle in the use of our bodies. So whatever we may be involving ourselves in, whatever it is we're doing, ask yourself, ask yourself the question, am I glorifying God in this body by this activity? In your sexual activity, am I glorifying God? You say, well, no, that's just about me. That, that's, ooh, that's ucky to talk about God in relationship to sex. No, it's not. Glorify God in your body, in your sexual activity. That's not ucky. Get that out of your minds. It's right and glorifying to satisfy your sexual desires in the context of that union that you have with your spouse. And that's the only context in which your sexual desires should be satisfied with your body. Fornication should not even be named among us, right? That's what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5. It should not even be named among us as is fitting for saints. It doesn't fit a saint. Sexual immorality. You cannot manage this sin. You've got to flee from it. You can't manage it. So if you are overtaken, if you have been overtaken, there may be some who didn't even want to hear the message tonight because you're thinking, well, you know, I'm just going to be beat up by this because I, you know, I, I have, I've, I've, Whatever, I've committed this, I've done that. I, I don't want to drag up memories and et cetera, et cetera. But oh, beloved, remember what we talked about this morning. If you are overtaken, if you have been, or if you will be, if you are overtaken, there is forgiveness with God and there is restoration. While this is a serious sin, it's a unique sin. It is not an unpardonable sin. It's not. not. Don't live with that. Don't, don't live with this like I'm stained, I'm polluted, you know, because of something I've done. No, no, you're, you're washed, you see, you're washed, you're clean. That's 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. By Jesus Christ and by that Holy Spirit who dwells in you. And so live, live in the in the purity that is intended for you. We're living, in, we're living in a day of very loose attitudes towards sexuality. And so I say to you in closing, pursue Christ, pursue holiness. Pursue Christ. Don't pursue holiness apart from Christ. That's a couple of weeks ago we preached on that. Okay, pursue Christ, pursue holiness, pursue purity. Do not be deceived by the loose attitudes of our day. Acknowledge that God is right about matters pertaining to sexuality and flee sexual immorality. Flee it. Flee it. Now you know, you agree. I don't know that there's a Christian in this room that doesn't agree with everything that I have said tonight. And as you're sitting there, you're thinking, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm... I, I'm Yes, you know, you kind of maybe feel strong, maybe, I don't know. But you've lived long enough to know there's some weak moments coming ahead, aren't there? There are some weak moments that are going to hit you. Don't forget, don't forget what you've heard tonight. Flee fornication, flee, just let that rattle in your mind. Flee idolatry, worship Christ. When there is that temptation to worship yourself, satisfy yourself. And this is not just in the area of sexuality. This is an area, any area, but in this area that so strongly grabs at us. Flee.
Worship Christ. Set your mind upon Christ. Set your mind upon things above. Be satisfied with Him.